Hello again, my name is Paul Gilbert, and I'm welcoming you to the Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. And today it's a great honor and a delight to be able to welcome Dr. Julian Abel, who's done fantastic work in how to build compassionate communities. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him, and then we will see what he has to say about his fantastic work that he's doing on building compassionate communities. So Dr. Julian Abel became consultant in palliative care in 2001, working initially as a district general hospital and a hospice. For more than a decade, he has become increasingly involved in finding ways of building compassionate communities around people at the end of life. He has run projects at local, regional and national level. He was the chair of the organizing committee for the fourth international conference on public health and palliative care held in Bristol in 2015, and until recently was vice president of Public Health Pal Palliative Care International. He is an international keynote speaker on public health and, pa and palliative care. He has published regularly on models of public health and palliative care. And Professor Abel and Professor Alan Kerhill, Kerhill are the editors of the Oxford textbook of public health palliative care. Now, since 2016, he's worked with, uh, with the From Medical Practice in Somerset in developing a new model of primary care combined with compassion communities. The health outcomes of this model have been dramatic, with this being the first intervention that has been effective in reducing population emergency admissions. Compassion communities is one of the most effective therapeutic tools we have in improving length of life and well-being. Along with Professor Cal here, he has formed Compassionate Communities UK, which he is the director. The charity is being formed to develop the broader role out and rollout of compassionate communities in both primary care and end of life care. Projects are underway in multiple areas in the UK and several international projects are under development. Dr. Julian Abel is joint author of the Compassion Project, which I have to say is a brilliant book, along with the prize winning novelist Lindsay Clark. The book describes the background to the FROM project, its implementation and the wider impl impl implementations of the application of compassion both to medicine and in society at large. He has run a podcast called Survival of the Kindness about compassion and its absence and also appears on podcasts and the media. So that's uh, quite a fantastic contribution to compassion, Julian. So how did you become interested in the idea of compassion and, and rooting your healthcare uh, programs, all these wonderful things you've been doing in compassion? How did that emerge for you? Well, thank you for such a great introduction. And, uh, and I have to say, uh, Paul, the honor is mine appearing on your podcast because uh, you know what you've done in this field is fantastic in so many different areas. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it's a funny thing is that I can kind of, I think like many children, uh, that social justice and compassionate care are inbuilt into us and part of who we are as human beings. And I, and I definitely remember that being the case. And it kind of gets trained out of us. But for me, it just, it stuck with me. And, um, and I remember that continuing. It's why I went into medicine in the first place. And I spent a while doing complementary therapies because it's like well okay what what can you do that is going to help people and be beneficial and um and then uh i i i, I think buddhism was a natural place for me uh, because it was like well it's based around compassion and uh um and what we can do to make the world a better place and that kind of informed my um the way that i thought about providing healthcare, about thinking about you know obviously it's not about me it's about the person in front of me and what was right for them and and palliative care is a very natural place for that because um the 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 i mean medicine's quite interesting in a kind of sherlock holmes way um, in in that it's got a kind of intellectual side of it, which is about the diagnosis and treatment. But that was never a main emphasis for me. And um, so uh, the bit about 
trying to place something in the help that's helpful in the context of someone's life um, and really listening and it's more than just simply about the symptom control or meeting needs it's about what's happening with this person what's happening with their relationships and their interconnectedness and uh, that was that was how I got into it and uh, how it developed and of course it's turned into this um incredible kind of biological uh, impetus about what compassion is and 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 how actually i mean it's why we called the podcast survival of the kindest it, it's about how actually this is naturally part of us and the the cruel bit you know the the competitive bit and the i'm better than other people's stuff is something that's got laid on top and it's perhaps reflective of a slightly different bi biological process. So that's how it developed. Yes, and I think that's such an important link that you make. And I saw your wonderful uh, TED talk where you showed the diagram that you know social connectedness is a much more powerful uh, predictor of things like more mortality and certain forms of, of health. So the point that you're making is that it's not just about being nice and kind to people, but actually these processes, these interconnected processes, the way we relate to each other have very powerful biological effects. And I think that's such a brilliant point you make. Uh, I, it's been, I mean, the podcast has been really helpful for me understanding it because that the article by Julianne Holt Lundstad, which is a diagram that that I that you're talking about, and for people who are listening, you can look at her 2010 article on social relationships and mortality, a meta a meta analytic analytic review, and 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 basically she was able to show through a really careful piece of work. That, um, that social relationships are more effective at reducing our risk of dying than giving out smoking, drinking, diet, exercise, and anything else you care to mention. And, uh, and that led me on to thinking, well, hang on a minute, this is a biological phenomenon. This isn't just a nice thing to have. And, and that uh, then I kind of followed that up with further investigation. And when you start to look for it, all the information is there. And I had a, a fantastic conversation with Steve Cole, who described his uh, research work going as uh, spanning three decades, looking at how social relationships have an impact on our biology and looking at how that Im has an impact on our genomic expression, on our immune system, and, and uh, really fantastic work, not just the negative impact of loneliness and isolation but the positive impact of good social relationships and then uh, i spoke with daka keltner who's a professor of psychology uh, in uh, california as well and he he's really interested in the pro-social nature of emotions from an evolutionary perspective and and i started to really build up this picture and this kind of common theme which is that, hold on a minute, these are evolutionary processes. And then you start looking back and you see that you find the structure of the nervous system, the functioning of our hormonal system, the, the functioning of our immune system, our physiology, our biochemistry. When you look for it, you see compassion is embedded within them. And you then start to look at the animal kingdom and you look at bonobo monkeys for examples which are the most you know social of monkeys and then you go back and you see the pro-social nature is present throughout the animal kingdom in in our physiology our biochemistry and everything else and and then you think okay look we were mutually dependent on each other as hunter gatherers that if we lost contact with our tribe of 20 to 200 people, our life is at risk, our food security at risk. We can't bring up children. We're at risk of predation, the major cause of death for uh, hunter gatherers. And um, and then you can, then do you, when you, like, I figured that when you look at it from, with that lens, you can then see connection, kindness, and compassion are really powerful evolutionary imperatives. And when you, when, you know, and having done the work in Froome and seen these 
this really extraordinary transformation, you kind of go, ah, that makes sense. The reason why that's so effective is because it's biological. It is we're, what we're doing is our, our proper functioning of as a human being in this world is connection, connectedness, and belonging. And, and it's really clear that if we want to lead a long, healthy, happy life, it's all about our relationships. It's all about our connection and our sense of belonging. So it's, it's been a fascinating journey and not one I would have predicted at all. No, but I mean, you are one of the leading pioneers of connecting um, the physiology of health and wellness to the importance of uh, social connectedness. And I mean, you know, we've got Darcy Navarre as one of our speakers as well, talking about the importance of early childhood that in hunter-gatherer societies, children were brought up in communities, not in these narrow families where they can be trapped in their homes with single parents or whatever. And that, you know, the care we experience early in life actually even affects our epigenetic profile. So it's profoundly powerful about whether we experience the world as safe helpful and in kind or whether we experience it as threatening and withdrawing so that, that i think that you you have established very well the importance of actually having this biopsychosocial approach to medicine can't just be focusing on the physiological stuff and then we come on to the wonderful work that you've done in somerset about how do you then create communities that provide these inputs to support people in their uh, well-being and in health and preventing of ill health. So it's a funny thing uh, because the principles of how to do this have been known for gen for generations. And in fact, you can look at many indigenous communities and uh, and you find that these principles are embedded into many indigenous cultures. But community development um, has got a history of how you do this ground up connectedness work about how you remove hierarchies about a very fundamental principle about is when people come together and they come together with a sense of openness and uh, equity and lack of hierarchy that in in many ways it's a coming together is a thing that makes a difference and you just have to stand back and because it all happens so that in, in from a community development perspective the first step is to is to ask the question what's already working well in communities and then you, and then when you when you open your eyes and then you see that that every community is full of treasures you know that from when when we think about the professional perspective of all of this you know our professional lives have a uh, have existed on creating maps of misery. When you go and get a grant for something, you, you, you map out the miserable neighborhoods or the miserable services or whatever the deficits are. And you go, look, this is terrible. The professional is a way that we've identified this, all this need and the professional is a way to solve it. And, and often what happens is the professionals come in and make it worse, unbelievably. There's another way of looking at it where you go, uh, let's look at the map, the community treasure map. And then you say, well, what's out there in the places where people already meet up? And then you start looking and you see, oh, wait a minute. There are men's sheds. There are walking groups. There are knitting groups. There are chatty cafes. There are in any community, you'll find hundreds of small community related activities where people are getting on and supporting each other. And then you go, well, okay, we've already got this wealth of treasure in communities. Let, why, don't we, why don't we work with all these fantastic things that are going on and help and stimulate more of them? And that's a process of community development and maybe connect them up so that they can support each other. And then you think, well, okay, why don't we why don't we put all this information onto a web directory so that anyone in the community can can find out what's going on in their community with all this where are the treasure maps in the community they're everywhere and then you and then you kind of go hang on a minute we we got all this stuff going on in the community 
we've got the web directory. Why don't we just do a really simple short training program of community connectors of activated citizens who know about the resource directory and know about the chatty cafes or the friendship cafes or the talking cafes and know about all the stuff about where to find it. And this is where the magic happens because in Froome now, a town of 28,000 people, over a thousand people have been trained as uh, these oh. act activated citizens, as community connectors. We know that people have at least 20 conversations per year about how the community can support the community, whether you're a hairdresser or a librarian or a receptionist or a cafe owner or a bar worker or a community support officer, whatever. 20 conversations of a thousand people is 20,000 conversations in a town of 28,000 people. It's, it's, it's like, it's mind blowing. Like, your deep dive into this community and what's happened is that you know when you go into Froome people are listening out for you you know this kind of uh oxytocin pulses around the streets of Froome and people are looking out for each other and um and Froome has got to be known as a friendly town so much so that people are moving there to live there which has created a housing problem and and it, People wandering around in T-shirts going, make Froome shit again, you know, because it's... <laughs> <laughs> so so when you when you think about community infrastructure like that, you know, and, and uh, I have to pay uh, uh, respect for uh, my colleagues, Helen Kingston and Jenny Hartnell, who started this whole project up and started doing this work. Helen's the lead GP in Froome and just had this natural common sense to do it. And, and Jenny has got this incredibly natural feeling for community development and just got on and, and got on and did it. And, and they kind of, uh, I was only a late hammer to this project, you know, it was a, um, uh, fortunate circumstances, but they did all this stuff and they did it from the health center. And you kind of go, why don't we connect it all up? Because people are coming to the health center, not because they got a cold, but maybe because they can't figure out their lives. They don't know what to do. They're feeling lonely and isolated and it's manifesting in their lives. And why don't we connect them up with stuff that's going on in the community and build the support around them? And, and there you go. And then it just, it, uh, and it, it's possible to do this everywhere. You like you if you if you start with your community treasure map, it's everywhere, everywhere. That is quite remarkable, isn't it? Really, and not only that, but also showing this change in admission rates and some really good, fascinating data that you got. It's not just that it makes everybody feel good, but it actually really does have an impact on on physical and mental well being. Well, the, the funny thing is that, of course, it's very hard to show uh, with a lot of these kind of initiatives, you kind of scratch your head and go, oh, how are we going to show that this is worthwhile? And, and because of the work, uh, the compassionate community work I've been doing in Somerset, um, I asked a question with the people who are managing the data about, um, you know, what's happening with the emergency admissions? Can, because we wondered. We thought it would help. And we were trying to secure our funding for the next year, going through the uh, annual agony of securing funding. And uh, and they gave us the data. And when I got the data back, I, you know, I mean, I'm I'm used to handling data. And I, you know, looked it up and, it, and my jaw hit the ground because we had no idea. Um, and because of the work that I've been doing previously in the hospital in Western, uh, Western Supermare in Somerset, um, North Somerset, um, I knew that there are no interventions which have ever reduced whole population hospital emergency admissions. This is like uh, um, the, the governments have given up trying to do anything about it because nobody had found anything that was successful. And, um, and, and so when I looked at that, I realized that this is, if there was a tablet that could do this, it would be a medical miracle, the likes of which we have not seen before. It's absolutely uh, <laughs> groundbreaking results. And, 
a, a, a revelation. And it, and it wasn't because we set out to reduce hospital emergency emissions, whole population emissions. It's just, if you like, a side effect and a, a fortunate circumstance, which we were lucky to come across it because we could show some hard outcomes which are really significant. That's incredible. And I, I don't know whether you were gathering data on mental well-being and mental health issues, uh, but they would be very interested to see the impact on mental health problems. So there's a uh, there's a variety of different data, and uh, and they collected a, a variety of data in Froome and uh, social connectedness, social belonging, you know, anxiety levels going down, depression <clears throat> levels decreasing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, collecting that in a rigorous scientific way is really tricky, and including that for um, scientific analysis becomes really problematic when you've only got sporadic examples and there's plenty of examples of qualitative data about how people's lives are transformed through uh, connection and uh, connection and belonging but finding the um uh, in, in a way i guess that the 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 emergency admissions in a way is not even the most profound thing because uh yeah, because you're transforming people's lives yeah. you know the story of people when you hear the stories i mean that's why we knew it was good you hear the stories about people who were lonely and isolated and depressed and uh, didn't know why they were even alive, who became connected, vibrant and transformed um, through social connection. And uh, and so uh, and, and of course, this, you know, you can then start tracking, you know, different life trajectories because of it. So, so for example, you might have a teenager who is being bullied, and um, and and then all the things that can come from that with a uh, uh, poor performance at school, low educational achievement. You then start thinking about uh, anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol use, teenage pregnancy, risk taking behaviours, all of that kind of stuff, and you go, well, does it need to be like that, or can we transform that? And with this sense of belonging where where you deal with this person who is feeling this lonely uh, loneliness and isolation and lack of value as a human being, then you say, no, you're a valuable person. And here's your community around you. And you have a tribe and you have a belonging and you're valuable. And then you see people transform. Mm. And change mm. and their life story changes now you know emergency emergency admissions are all well and good but what happens when you take a whole population and you focus on that sense of belonging and then the whole population can change and transform yes i think that's incredible and one of the things that you make very clear is that not only do we want to feel we are cared about but we also want to feel we make a contribution and I'm very interested in that idea of these thousands sort of volunteers that actually what I do matters to somebody. Yeah, and exactly. And that ability to make a contribution, which is where we kind of lost the generation in the 80s where there were these young men didn't feel they were needed by anybody. But the capacity that I can make a contribution and, uh, is such an important issue that give people meaning of things they can do that are meaningful. Absolutely. And I, um, I, uh, I had this uh, a really uh, just a fantastic uh, palliative care doctor called Nahid Dasani in, in Canada, who was talking about the work he's doing with homelessness. And it's a fantastic work. And he was talking about street family and talking about how um, when when the street family for homeless people are the people around them. And when you go to the street family and say, can you care for this person who is dying? The street family pick it up and go, that's fantastic. And what they say afterwards is, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to look after my friend. Yeah, yeah. You know, where that sense of value, uh, it's, it's like we have uh, this incredible potential of... Uh, care and compassion inside us it's a treasure and when when that treasure manifests then we know it we absolutely know it 
you know there's a there's a fantastic quote from Bessel van der Kolk who who I'm sure you'll know and uh, for the listeners he's he wrote this absolutely wonderful book called The Body Keeps a Score and has done stunning work on, with trauma over decades again and um and he talks about how uh, that sense of value is uh knowing that we are held in the hearts and minds of the people around us and likewise that we hold people in our own hearts and minds and he says for our physiology to calm down for us to heal and grow uh, these are things that are absolutely fundamental and no doctor can write a prescription for them so yeah, yeah wonderful quote that's absolutely right. And the idea that compassion is flow, it's not just all coming in, but it's also, it's like a breath, really. You breathe it in and breathe it out. Um, I, I, it reminds me of back in the 70s and 80s when I was a young psychologist, what was called community psychology. And in those days, we used to have a group of agoraphobia and mildly depressed people, and then we'd work with them, and then we'd bring in some more. And they, the ones that we'd work with, they would work with the new ones and work with the new ones. We'd build these real big groups up, and they, I remember my group formed a group called the Way Out Club. <laughs> we <used to> organized, <laughs> uh, you know, visit people and organize trips and everything. But unfortunately, then the government brought in payment by results. And so that was the end of that. So if you're not doing a recognized therapy, then that was the end of that, which was very tragic. But I mean, the point about it is, is this way of working with communities, I think, is it has to be the future. The, the, I suppose the question, next question is, is, Given the clear biology, given the clear biological evidence, given the clear evidence that you and other uh, individuals have got about impacts in on the health service, what can we do to get governments to take an interest in this? Well, I think you're already working in this space, Paul, and uh, the incredible work you're doing around compassion in compassion in politics, and um, and it's it's uh, I've spoken to you know trying to understand about how we do this and talking to people who work in politics and t talking to Matt Hawkins as well from Compassion in Politics and uh, talking to people who've had contact with politicians and um, and uh, it's it's a uh, I think that the so my experience is that that you know even when you present overwhelming evidence and even when that evidence shows cost reduction that um that there's not much interest because the way that politics is configured uh, is is largely about self interest and the higher you get up the hierarchy, the worse that that self-interest is. And it, and it, and it's fascinating to think about the traumatizing nature of the institutions and the traumatizing nature of the childhood institutions that many of those people have been through. And we know very well about the impact of uh, uh, childhood trauma on childhood development, on the the neurobiology of it uh, about what happens to the brain etc cetera, etc cetera, and uh, locking small children up in brutal institutions uh, doesn't provide uh, healthy adults and uh, um and and i think that that that, that actually uh, so I, even when you present the evidence it doesn't make that much difference and i think the work that you're doing is more in the direction that we need to go, which is to say, actually, uh, uh, we need to bring compassion into politics. There's, there's another, uh, alongside it, there's another movement that is taking place, which is really interesting, which is um, at the same time as this polarization, there's a counter reaction to it. And, and local democracy is growing in a wide variety of different places. And um, and so you look at uh, movements such as uh, flat pack democracy, um, which is uh, a way of thinking about how you, if you like, you kind of combine. It's participatory democracy. It's combining community development with democratic principles. And and Cormac Russell, who runs uh, asset based community development, which is a uh, fantastic work has done a good book called rekindling democracy which is which is about um uh, how professionals can recreate and re realign into the space of communities and 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 his most recent book 
um, which is called, oh, man, it's gone out of my head, um, um, the Connected Community, uh, which is about how communities can do this. And these are political acts. And, it's a, uh, and we definitely need to affect politics and business is to, is to reduce the self-interest and think about uh, how, uh, how we can grow from the ground up. There's another kind of interesting aspect of that, which is, uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Gene Sharp, who wrote a book called From Dictatorship to Democracy, and, uh, and uh, which is about how social action uh, and civil disobedience has got a really important role to play in creating social movements. And uh, another good book called Doing Democracy by Bill Moyer, which is um, about how you create social movements over decades and the principles of that. And I, I think that's a, an important facet of how we get change is about the uh, social movement social connectedness aspect of it which influences politicians that's incredibly inspiring inspiring Gillian yeah I mean I think the point that you're making is a good one I mean you probably know we have the three c's compassion callousness and cruelty so compassion is sensitivity to suffering wanting to do callous is, is you don't want to cause it but you're insensitive and you don't care if you do and then cruelty that is the point suffering is the point of it and I think what you're saying is a lot of our politicians have come through services that they've actually grown to be callous. And we live in a society where the media are so aggressive to politicians that if they don't learn to become thick skinned, they're not going to get anywhere. But in becoming thick skinned, they actually become callous. And, I'm, you know, we've obviously seen that in the last few years with our, the government's moving to the right. So, um I agree with you. I think working at the top is a little bit tricky, but what you're saying is such an important thing is that actually it's about working upwards as well as downwards and getting people to understand that, you know, these compassion processes really are the processes that create a real genuine foundation for well-being, health and prosperity. I mean, there's quite a lot of evidence now that compassionate business that takes an interest in the, the workplace, that takes an interest in what they're producing and not damaging the ecologies and so on. These are, these are the companies that are going to progress. And those that are damaging the economy and treat their staff like rubbish, uh, those will gradually fade away. So there is a little bit of that happening in business too, I think. Uh, I think that's right. And it, it, what's interesting, what, you know, we learn as we get older, hopefully, you know, um, uh, but um uh, it's interesting when you look at research paradigms and you think about, oh, we get fixated on health outcomes. But when you when you approach things from a community development perspective, then then uh, when you do this ground up community development where where compassion and care can flourish, is that what you see is that you get outcomes in all kinds of completely unexpected places. And um, and we're we're uh, writing a paper about. Um, about reframing uh, research, because uh, rather than thinking about reductionist approach to research, where you try and narrow everything down into this isolated system, um, you know, having causal relationships, you can think about emergence. And, and when you do community development, you see emergence in all kinds of different areas. And, uh, and if you don't look for them, then you're never going to find them. So one of the ways that you can think about, well, where do we need to look is using the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so so and they're all intimately interlinked. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the quality of the environment, the quality of uh, good work in the workplaces, uh, educational achievements, the the uh, the inequality, the poverty, all of those things improve when you go looking for them and there are incredible stories of it and uh, a great example is the work of uh, Hazel Stutley with the work that she did down on the Beacon Estate the Beacon Project in Falmouth on the Glen Warris Estate and and she found outcomes she started looking for these outcomes again trying to prove the value and saw improvement in educational achievement of boys an enormous improvement and um a reduction in drug and alcohol usage and decreased crime and um, decreased uh, postnatal depression. And, and, and so when you look, you find incredible 
uh, areas of improvement. And it's about thinking about where you can look over five to 10 years to see these changes take place. Yes, and I think I think that's such a because the key thing is trying to convince politicians that what looks like soft science is actually because they're all keen on you know the newest drug or whatever it is, uh, but what looks like soft science is actually the one that's actually going to give you the much the best results because it's exactly. not really soft science. They just see it that way, um, and that actually from what you're saying, what I think as well. It's just amazing to me that politicians have not jumped onto this cart. I mean, we've got, you know, IAPT and all that stuff, giving individual therapies and everything. But really working with the work you do, that has to be the way forward, I, I would have thought. Uh, uh, it's it's fascinating. And there's yet another book, you know, uh, which, uh, which is helpful, which is uh, a book called The Spirit Level. And it's a... <laughs> Uh, oh, you know it. So uh, yeah, we got Richard. He's going to do an interview. Uh, he's one. Oh, great! <laughs> um, uh, that uh, when you when you look at uh, inequality around the world, um, and you look at the level of inequality and correlate that with the wide variety of different outcomes in health, in education, in environment, you see that people who have the most inequality have the worst outcomes. And, and of course, the US and the UK are top of that list. And, and it's, it's really clear um, that uh, um, it's really clear that inequality is a major source of, uh, of poor outcomes, that economists know this, the politicians know it as well, but they're not remotely interested in doing anything about it. And I, I kind of go back to the reasoning and logic is not, I think, the solution. It is about awakening the humanity of the politicians, which is why I think the work that you're doing is so fundamentally important. Yes, I mean, I think oh, it's, it's it's key. I mean, one of the things you're touching on is something that's dear to my heart, which that nearly all the professions sort of need to keep to, to to scientific evidence i mean you know if we started to invent snake oil or something we'd be struck off wouldn't we but politicians can just make it up yeah exactly I mean, you know unfortunately the the politicians we have at the moment with all these tax cuts they've made it up there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that unequal societies do better than equal societies it's just made up nonsense and yeah. yet there's no ways in which we can kind of <laughs> hold them to account and strike them off you know <laughs> do you know uh um there's a growing uh local movement where near where uh, just around where i live which is looking at the use of the sustainable development goals as a way of uh thinking about policy because uh you can you can checklist you can say okay let's look at for any particular policy decision yeah. let's look at the positive and negative impact on each of the sustainable development goals and you can do it in a in a kind of a, a rough way it doesn't have to be precise but as long as you've got the positive and negative impacts there then you can think about your policy decisions and and kind of checklist to whether this makes sense or not and i really like this approach because uh, what it does is uh, it stops the it reduces the risk of the lying, you know, that you would go you would immediately uh, think about. So if you took, you know, uh, knocking off five P in the pound tax for people who earned over one hundred and fifty thousand uh, pounds, then you would go, well, what are the impacts of that going to be? Um, so the positive impact would be that the rich people would get richer and, you know, and, and economists will tell you that that uh, the rich getting richer doesn't result in local investment. They just stick it into hedge funds. It's extractive economy. It makes things worse. And then you go, well, the negative impacts actually is, you know, all the negative impacts of increasing inequality, you know, and then and then you're kind of going, oh, wait a minute. This isn't just some fairy story that somebody made up. This is a, here are some criteria which we can check against. And I think we've got a need in politics to have a, uh, 
an adult discussion about thinking about the positive and negative impacts of everything. And we, there are places we can look, which can have a look at that and they're interconnected. So uh, it, I think in terms of, you know, it kind of fits cap in hand with uh, um, uh, the, this uh, local democracy movement um, of which flat pack democracy is part of, you know, which are uh, saying, okay, we can do this in a different way. We can do it in a participatory way and use the pressure of that to influence politicians. Yeah, I mean, that's such a, I think that's really important. And I know the, you know, Jennifer and Nadal and Matt Hawkins are very keen on having it such that we should not be passing policies that knowingly do damage to those least able to defend themselves as we had in austerity and all of that. I mean, the IMF have been very critical of what's going on within us at the moment. The United Nations is very critical of what we did in austerity. So it's not that we lack these, it's just that the politicians don't pay any attention to yeah, them. Yeah. And Absolutely. then you have a right wing media who's just stirs the whole pot and sells the blood on the carpet, don't they really? So, so the all of these things, I think what you're pointing out is that we do have the means, we do have the ways of thinking, we can do these assessments. The question is now, um, how we get people who in authority to kind of start paying attention to them. And what you're saying is, well, probably the first is to begin, you know, grassroots up and get these local movements taking an interest in how to create compassionate societies, compassionate communities at your local level. That's it, exactly it. I think you've expressed it really clearly. I think that's exactly right. And and uh, the nice thing is that it's 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 something that everyone can join in. And and uh, and and the other thing is that you know that, that this is uh, I think it like we're talking ideas, but there's a visceral bit of this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the visceral bit is. We know what it's like when we live in a community where we can go down the shops and chat to someone that we know and think, what a nice person. Or we, we're in love and we hold the hand of the person that we love or we see our new baby or uh, all of these multiple things, which in our workplace, you know, where we somebody says, do you want a cup of tea? And you sit down and have a chat. And these are visceral things where we feel better from them. And, and when we feel better like that, when we feel connected and belonging, it has a ripple effect on the people around us and they feel better and belong. And in a way, it's kind of bringing it back to that is to say, don't feel fear. Don't be triggered by the media. Look at the world around you and look at the connection that you have. And um, and it kind of takes me back to Bessel van der Kolk as well, because he describes so clearly about how we receive the information from the outside world. And um, and our our midbrain has got this processing place where uh, it, it checks everything just to make sure we're not in danger, because if we're in danger, we need to use our you know, we don't have time to process it in a in our prefrontal cortex or our cerebral hemispheres. We just got to get out of there and do something about it. The fight, fright, flight, or freeze reflex. But for us, to, it, it's very easy to stimulate that fear reflex, which stops us thinking. But we can do the opposite. We have a choice, and when we and when we choose to see the value of compassion and choose to take small steps personally to be more compassionate, then we can be fully present as a human being and fully present in our functioning and, and, and then have that section of uh, that sense of connection and belonging, which is open to all of us. And, and when, and in particularly important is that when personally, we welcome people who we might otherwise not welcome into our hearts and minds. That allows their physiology to calm down and feel like they're a valuable human being and feel a sense of belonging and connection. And in a way, all of it comes down to that personal action. I think this is something that, you know, where, and you both of us are very keen on, we've got to get this into the schools, we've got to teach yeah. children. 
about these processes, about how their minds work. You know, we've got to teach them about, you know, with some of the work we're doing about what is it to be a good friend rather than just to kind of constantly pass exams and win and got to be the best. What is it to be actually a, com a compassionate being? What does that actually mean? What is the courage of compassion? Why do we need courage and compassion? All these things, right? Because I don't know about you, when I when I was growing up, Nobody taught me anything about my brain. I mean, the most amazing, complicated things I need to learn about. So I learned about what happened in 1620. Not, I hadn't got a clue what was going on inside my head. That has to change, right? <laughs> well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, Paul. If you had learned about how your brain functioned at the age of 10, you would remember it to this day. Yeah. But I bet your bottom dollar you can't remember what happened in 1620. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it wasn't very good, but <laughs> no, but that's right. And teaching children ways of understanding their emotions and so on and so on, but also the importance of social connectors okay. and creating opportunities within schools for cooperative learning and so on and so on. So, you know, I think getting this message that you're offering all the way through the system in communities and schools and also through businesses is is well it's very inspiring i think so you know that's that's the way forward really i uh, i think the pressure for that will grow well, yeah. as we see increasing environmental destruction and uh, I, I think people are connecting up the dots um where uh, actually our own behavior has an impact on the world around us i love that that like i love the uh uh, the indigenous perspective of this when they talk about kinship and kinship is uh, not just family members um, but it's all humans and it's all animals and it's the plants and it's the ground on which we walk and the air we breathe and the water we drink and actually we're all made of stardust and it comes and so kinship includes a whole universe and then when you have that sense of kinship, you have that sense of accountability and responsibility, knowing that you're connected to everything. And, and in a way, there's a, I, I have this quite strong sense that the uh, many indigenous cultures are the knowledge holders. They've kept these traditions alive and, and that the, the Western world is beginning to wake up to the depths of the wisdom that you can find in these different traditions and and i think that that will spread and grow you know i think that's because you know well it's a rate there's a race on between environmental destruction and a sense of kinship yes. and i i know which one i hope will win yes <laughs> well we're all, we're all on the side of that i mean the the last question really and then we can kind of pull things together is that I mean, one of the things you're, you know, I'm very keen on is how do we address the dark side? Because we've got to find ways in which we can deal with some of these, particularly, but not only males, but aggressive dominant males and the Putins of this world and so on and so on, because if they get into power, they do terrible damage and they have been doing damage for thousands of years. You look at the leaders that have actually led us into war after war after war. So there has to be a way in which we can begin to think about how does compassion address the dark side, that attraction you know, you don't have to go to Star Wars, that attraction to become tribal and, and so on and so on. Do you, do you have you, what are your thoughts about how we can address tribalism, this, this tribal identity? Belonging is all very well, but it depends what you do with it. Um, have you had any thoughts about that? So, yeah, so it's interesting because if you look at, say, a motorcycle gang or a drug gang or... Um, whatever kind of a gang it is, is yeah. that you can see that contained within there that a sense of belonging is really important. And uh, and so it's about, are you looking at a treasure map or are you looking at a map of misery? Yeah. And, and I think it's about that thing about belonging, not being in a group, but in a sense of broader connectedness. I think it's... it's uh, when you look, uh, I think historically, um, that by and large, um, that religions have been the gatekeepers of uh, uh, kindness and compassion. <clears throat> but uh, often religions, you know, um, have been the gatekeepers of violence and aggression at the same time. 
I think there's a really interesting development over the last 30 years, in particular with the development of functional MRI, which allows us to see inside the black box of the brain and the use of things like polymerase chain reaction and our knowledge of uh, how the, our genomics functions and measuring of telomeres and that kind of stuff. Uh, I think there's a really interesting shift which is about how, how we move from care and compassion being religious based to being biologically based. And, and that, that as that interest develops, then, you know, it's like we can show the impact of that in a wide variety of different places. And I think that the, um, that it that we have to. I mean, one of the things I'm involved with, which is it's a compassionate city charter, which is a, 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 a the civic way in which a, a public health way in which you address all of these areas. So you address compassionate workplaces, compassionate schools, compassionate faith organisations, uh, compassionate education institutions, compassionate civic spaces, uh, and compassionate policy, compassionate media compassionate uh compassionate creative world uh, is that when you when you when you have that kind of initiative what you're saying to people is stop look connectedness belonging is key it's fundamental to everything we have in this life and and so you know the things like this podcast and the work you're doing with compassion in politics and the, the writings that you do is it's about the public engagement and ownership of all of that work, the pro-democracy movement, the community development movement, the, the wide variety of different ways that we can talk about this helps people to have that sense of belonging because when people feel comfortable and belonging, have, they're not feeling isolated and unvalued, that they have that sense of connection and they know how to be a good human being. And it doesn't get distorted in it's. So if you like um, the, uh, the belonging to, to, to things that cause harm uh, as distorted um, because people are feeling fearful and tight and it's about keeping the positive qualities of belonging and reducing the fear and using social connectedness to increase that sense of belonging in our streets and our neighborhoods and our cities and our towns and our villages all over the world. And so that people feel connected. And, uh, and I think we, it's an absolute necessity to do that in business and politics as well. You know, they need to be part of that and the media. Yeah, so I think the point you're making is there's, there are different dimensions of connectedness. We can be connectedness through fascist organizations or, or, the, or, or the hell's angels or whatever. So the connectedness is through motivation of bringing something into the world, particularly the desire not to be harmful, but to be helpful. You know, the desire to address suffering. You know, the Buddhist position really is that if you look at life, you know, life is full of suffering. You've got the processes of growing, then decaying, illness, sickness, and eventual death. Everybody's on that journey, everybody. Nobody gets away with it. So given that we're all on the same journey, given that we're all subject to the sufferings and slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and so on, it makes sense that we can combine to say, okay, well, why don't we help each other then? Why don't we help each other? And certainly in the states of suffering, certainly try to prevent it and certainly not cause it. You know, if we can just get people to take an interest in that, let's belong to a society that does not want to cause suffering, that will try to address it if we possibly can. That would be really fantastic. And that's what we're trying to do, that motivation, that motivation to see that life is full of suffering. Uh, but with a compassionate orientation, we can do a lot. <laughs> So I guess there's a um, an element of it which is um, that I, in a way um, when you're thinking if you're thinking about it from a Buddhist perspective the nature of existence is suffering but that's not the only thing because it's a relief of suffering 
yes. and the relief of suffering is found through loving kindness and compassion. Yes. So it's it's and it's kind of taking, um, uh, if you like, uh, the chariot of loving kindness yeah. and compassion is a vehicle yeah. to releasing the releasing of suffering, the yeah. relief of suffering, and, and it's, it's that deficit, but you know the misery map of misery or the treasure map, yeah. and the treasure yeah. map. You're never going to solve the map of misery, but you can enhance the treasures and the misery disappears. That's a wonderful note. So before we finish, I'm just going to invite you to any other reflections you'd like to make and maybe think about how people could get involved with your work or find out more about what you're doing or involved with community projects. So there are lots and lots of different ways. Uh, I think there's a very personal thing about yeah, I think it's a good idea to be a bit more compassionate. And uh, and so uh, ask your friend about how they are, make them a cup of tea, sit down and say, how's your day? And really listen, you know, simple things like that are really important. Um, and then connecting with stuff going on in your local community, seeing your, looking for your community treasures. I think that's really important. And then, um, and then you know, there are uh, uh, things which are, which improved the variety of different ways that described in the sustainable development goals are really good. We've got stacks of information on our website and, and listen to the podcasts and share them. And, and I think that connect with the work that you're doing, connect with local democracy, connect with compassion in politics, write to your MP about it, you know, uh, educate yourself in it. And just uh, at the heart of it is being a kinder, more compassionate person. Julian, you are an inspiration to us all. Thank you so much for the brilliant work you're doing. And hopefully people watching this podcast and this uh, talk interview will be inspired and get more involved with what you're saying, because I think it's incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much for giving of your time to talk to us. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you, Paul, and, and uh, your work is equally inspiring. And I would say keep going and um, please do come on my podcast. I'm going to get a date out of you for it. All right. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Goodbye for now. Thank you. Thanks very much.